Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks, where we meet with the top thought leaders and strategists in TradFi, digital assets, technology, and financial planning. I'm your host, Jill Malandrino, and joining me on the desk at the NASDAQ Market Site is Brandon Mulvihill, co-founder and CEO of Crossover Markets, Samir Shalabi, founder and co-CEO of Versify, and Janine hightower Salido, Chief Commercial and Strategy Officer of EDX Markets. They join us to discuss the convergence of TradFi and digital assets. We'll also talk some regulation as well. It is great to have everyone with us on my favorite subject. <laughs> so before we get into that, let's go around the horn here. Brandon, we'll start with you. Explain to us where Crossover Market sits within the ecosystem. Uh, certainly. So first of all, Brandon Mulhill, as you said, uh, CEO and one of the three co-founders. Uh, all three co-founders came from the TradFi markets. And so our idea was to bring expertise from the equities and FX market from a trading capacity, uh, things like market data, liquidity management, order execution, into the digital space, uh, specifically aimed at institutions. And what we've done is we've built uh, an execution-only platform we call CrossX. And the idea of CrossX is to really fundamentally encourage the separation between clearing or prime brokerage and custody and trade execution. And we'll talk about why we think those things are important, but we're happy to report that we, uh, we launched CrossX uh, three quarters ago, nine months ago. And so uh, it's been a pleasant ride and uh, a lot to share today, we're excited. It's always interesting to hear when people come from TradFi and build the markets in, in the digital asset space. Um, Samir, explain to us where Versify fits within the ecosystem. <coughs> yeah, so first of all, Samir Shalvi, my background is 30 plus years in the FinTech space. Last 20 or so, I've been focused on uh, alternative investment space, dealt with a lot of the world's largest hedge funds, and uh, started uh, Versify about 18 months ago or so after a lot of conversations with TradFi hedge fund managers that wanted to trade in the digital asset space and saw a lot of challenges. So we set up Versify to build a trading and lending platform that is primarily focused on institutional investors and trying to bridge a lot of the gaps and the issues which we'll talk about in a minute. All right, and Jillian, uh, Jeanine, excuse me. Thanks, we've uh, come out of a very similar mindset in terms of a TradFi look into the crypto markets. EDX was started almost two years ago uh, with backers like Citadel, Virtu, Fidelity, and Schwab that took a look at the crypto markets and found it very foreign uh, compared to what they're used to in the traditional market space. Uh, most of our uh, backers, as well as most of our employees, have an equities background, and we really look at it through a traditional lens. So we've built a new type of market uh, for crypto, for digital assets, that focuses on TradFi principles, meaning execution only, separate from custody, separate from brokerage. We do offer a clearinghouse so customers can maintain their own custodians and simply trade on EDX as well as clear through EDX and ensure the settlement of their trades. But importantly, we're institutional only. We believe in a separation of roles within the market ecosystem. And I think similar to others on this panel, we believe that there's more institutional demand for crypto and finding the services that our customers need and delivering them to them will help grow the crypto ecosystem. Yeah, and Brian, let's kick off and, and discuss that the institutional adoption of crypto. And I think separating the, the trading from the, the custody part of it has been um, a, a catalyst to get that going. So when we think about the convergence of TradFi and, and digital assets, how do you see that evolving as institutions start to adopt crypto within their strategies? Yeah, I think there's a question everyone keeps asking, where is the institutional volume, right? And if we look at the health of the market, uh, we should be starting by looking at the, the spot market, right? The underlying market, what's happening? And, and right now, in centralized exchanges, the, the spot market is trading anywhere from 500 billion to 3.5 trillion per month in, in volume. So that's the range of wallet of what we've seen over the last several years, highs and lows. And when we look at that, we say, well, th that needs to be orders of magnitude higher. There's no reason to think that can't be 30, 40, 50 times X. So the question is, why isn't it? The number one reason is cost, okay? And cost has kind of two sides to this story. Um, the first is cost of capital. In today's market, there is no fungibility. And so if you're a, a financial institution, you're trading with 300 counterparties, you have to settle with every single one of those counterparties. So operational inefficiency is high. The cost of capital is very high. That, that's not ideally the way that things would work in the TradFi space. Similarly, what's happening in the space today is when you buy or sell uh, Bitcoin dollar, let's say, with a crypto exchange, you are captive to that exchange. So if you buy with exchange A, you have to, by definition, sell with exchange A. And so that increases the cost of trading. Uh, just to give you an idea, right now in crypto, institutions pay, and this is, a, give me some rope here, are paying anywhere from one basis point to 10 basis points. 
by comparison, this is around 100 to 1,000 times more expensive than what an institution would pay for an FX contract, just to show you how far off market we are in fees. And so what can we do about it? We've already touched on it a little bit. Fundamentally, what we need to do is we need to separate the clearing from the execution so that an institutional client can trade with 300 counterparties but net settle with one that drives up operational efficiency, drives down the cost of capital. And separately, when that institution goes to trade, if they buy Bitcoin on our product CrossX, and 10 minutes later they want to close their position and we're not the best price at that moment in time, they have the flexibility to go do that. And that's fundamentally how you can then drive down the cost of trading. And so if we can achieve both of those things, we can reduce the cost of trading and in turn, massively increase the total trading volume in the industry. So it would function like an equity market? E equity or FX. Right, Equities right. would call it clearing and FX would call it prime brokerage. It's fundamentally the same thing, the separation between uh, the clearing and settlement and the trade execution. Right, and institutions understand that. Uh, absolutely. <coughs> absolutely, I mean we've seen a lot of interest in, in the institutional market to try to get access to the digital asset space the last several years. There was definitely a, a bit of a pause obviously around the crypto winter but the demand has been consistent. We've, sun, uh, we've seen some of the largest hedge fund managers out, out there building and establishing these teams that are just focused on digital assets and trying to figure out the strategy. Um, so there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of interest in this market, and it's, it's no surprise. This is giving us diversification, giving us innovation, technology, growth, et cetera. So this is all great, but I would probably add to the cost, I would add some of the challenges that, the, that these managers are seeing Regulations is a huge problem. Yeah. Market structure is another huge problem. I mean, the market structure looks very foreign to these guys. I mean, I've heard it repeatedly. You know, it needs to look like digital, like the, uh, the thread FI, you know, yeah. the thread FI space that they're more familiar with. Um, so there's a lot of questions around, uh, you know, regulations, a lot of uh, questions around uh, market structure, once we address those, I think the volumes will increase significantly. And, and we'll get into regulation in a moment here, but I think that's an important distinction that um, Sumir makes, Janine, um, it, that it does have to mimic what TradFi looks like so they can understand it. Because sometimes when you talk about the adoption of digital assets, it's predicated on, you know, the, the spot Bitcoin ETF and, and, you know, the fundamental reasons why, but you also have to put on the institutional hat, separate that from retail, and uh, without market structure and consistent regulation, which we'll get into, that's really the catalyst. That, that's right, I think the price movement as a result of the approval of the Bitcoin ETF certainly is a catalyst to garner people's interest in the space, both retail <coughs> and institutional, but fundamentally it's the building blocks of a market that make it a reliable and stable place for institutions to do business, and, and that's what they need. Uh, today's institutions are not looking to speculate in early day market structure for, for digital assets. They want it to look like equities, like FX, like a product that they know. And you know, I had spent 20 years in equities before getting into blockchain and crypto myself, and I think I came into it with a view that it has to work exactly the same way that other markets work. And I think we've all learned it doesn't have to be exactly the same, but there are some core principles of traditional markets that hold true and that the world's markets have been built upon for a century. Separation of roles between custodian, prime broker, executing broker, and exchanges. Price discovery happening, at least for a large part of the market, on exchanges so customers know what the price is are assured that their assets are safe and they are assured that their broker's working in their own best interests. And those are some of the advents that we think we're all bringing to the market that can help this market grow into that new segment um, because it is a different type of customer that's now looking at crypto that with the approval of the ETF is taking a look at it. And one thing I think that's particularly interesting and sometimes lost in the discussion about the ETF is that all of the new flows coming in are not just solely into the ETF. It's, it's firms as well as retail actually moving into the physical product itself. And we've seen growth in that as well, which I mean, I'm a little bit surprised about because I thought there would be a huge, you know, huge inflows into the ETF and maybe at the expense of customers coming in to spot, spot Bitcoin itself. But we haven't seen that. I think the need for a 24 hour market, direct ownership are some of the things that we don't necessarily have in other assets mm -hmm. that are, you know, uh, bellwethers for what could come in tradi into traditional financial markets um, and that we can all lead upon. But we also need to learn from our experiences in traditional markets in terms of what the customers are actually demanding. Well, it's interesting that they're going to the spot market, which to me suggests that you're starting to see more liquidity mm -hmm. as more platforms such as yours come online. But Samir, we need regulatory clarity and we need it consistent and not, you know, 
bifurcated among different jurisdictions. I mean, other parts of the world have been able to form cohesive legislation around that. Would you agree that regulatory no. clarity is key here? Absolutely. I mean, like I said, it has been the number one concern for a lot of these institutional investors is dealing with the regulatory clarity. There is a lot of you know unknowns, and, and we all saw last year uh, regulating by enforcement is not the way to go. Everybody was freaking out. I mean, this is not a way to operate a market. Um, and instead, everybody would like to see a little bit more clarity, a framework that is being established that is cohesive and that is consistent to enable all the service providers to enter the market as well as the actual investors to join the market. So we've seen you know, efforts, for example, in Europe. Uh, EU is now putting MICA in place. We've seen uh, you know, um, the United Arab Emirates and Abu Dhabi is trying to step up to be kind of the crypto hub and putting all this regulation in place. We've seen VASP in the islands and, uh, you know, BVI and so on. So there's a lot of uh, opportunities and a lot of frameworks evolving, but unfortunately the U.S. is, is kind of missing in action. And this is Can a we make a, a quick distinction why, in, in my mind, what Mika is doing out in Europe that's interesting is um, bringing in uh, regulation from TradFi, from other markets, almost copying and pasting it, right, into all the, you, you mentioned a lot of these uh, points, especially for retail on capital adequacy and the treatment of client money and advertising disclosures and things like this. But what Mika did that was, uh, I think, really interesting is they're doing this while maintaining that crypto is in its own lane, it's its own asset class. Mm -hmm. And uh, that contradicts what we see in the U.S., where crypto seems to be, uh, we're trying to pigeonhole it as a security or as a commodity. Some coins might be here, some coins might be there. It creates a lot of confusion uh, versus if you wanna uh, open up a brokerage tomorrow and you wanna offer equities to your clients, you're gonna go to the SEC and there's a whole framework. If you wanna open a futures broker, you're gonna go to the CFTC and there's a, it's very, very clear. Uh, right now, I think part of the confusion <coughs> is um, uh, this disconnect between uh, trying to force crypto to be something that already exists or putting it in, recognizing it's its own thing that we could regulate by, by using uh, a page out of the TradFi book. And I think we have a huge opportunity in the U.S. to grow this market. We see a huge growth potential for EDX, which is a U.S.-based marketplace for digital assets. We see over the long run, but it is in a short-term constraint right now because it's you know, regulation by enforcement and regulation by lawsuit, which are is maybe even worse than, than enforcement actions. And so that's been a real challenge. But one of the things that I think we're missing in terms of opportunity is that a lot of firms that are focused on digital assets are moving offshore. And they've told us again and again, they prefer to trade on a U.S.-based market. They trust the U.S. regulators. They want to be regulated in the U.S., but they're being forced to move assets offshore. And that's a real um, disadvantage for the U.S. market in the long run. And for me, you know, and for all of us that have come out of TradFi, where we see blockchain sort of as a fundamental building block of new market tech over the next decades uh, to lose all of those assets and learnings and opportunities. We get the talent brain drain as well. That's right. And, uh, absolutely, and it's actually not just offshore and outside the U.S., but even New York. Mm -hmm. New York has imposed all the bit license regulations and all these problems that are making it more difficult for firms to be in New York, for investors to invest uh, in, out of New York. It's, it's really difficult. So the framework, like you were saying, Brendan, I agree with you. You shouldn't take a shortcut and say, okay, well, we're gonna, this is security or this is a commodity or this is whatever. This is a new lane. This needs to be defined and regulated as a standalone kind of asset class but unfortunately the U.S. has not recognized I think the bigger problem is, is that we've always been the leaders in the capital market space, right? You know, the most liquid, best marketing, we know the reasons to list in the U.S. Um, the capital markets are evolving, however, and there, there's you know, multiple ways and alternative ways to formulate capital as we move on to a digital economy, and we want to be there at the building blocks of building this capital market digital asset regulation, and my concern is besides the talent brain drain is that we're going to fall behind. Mm -hmm. So there's no question that we're going to fall behind. And, the, and the, the, ch the challenge and the problem is, we all know, the, we at least sitting in this, in this panel, we all know that digital assets are here to stay. Mm -hmm. And this is an asset class that no question that everybody's gonna catch on. And frankly, people are changing their tunes, right? In 2017, you know, BlackRock and Larry Fink said the only use for uh, uh, Bitcoin was money laundering. And now he's managing the world's largest you know, ETF in Bitcoin. So, People are starting to recognize the benefits of this asset class. Now the regulators need to get on board. But I'll tell you, all of us can help as an industry by creating that market structure that is easy to understand and easy to regulate. 
Mm -hmm. You know, combining things like custody and, and exchange activity doesn't make any sense. And I think everybody here agrees, right? Well, but, but it has been, you know, for some reason, it has been the, the norm, if you will. That's a big problem and it needs to change. And, and thankfully, there are startups, certain companies are trying to do this, but also some of the other market participants are starting to realize, okay, well, maybe we should break this up, maybe we should work as an exchange work with other custodians. Uh, so there is a movement towards that, and this is really, really important because obviously counterparty risk and the blow up of FTX kind of taught everybody the, the, the real reason why there's an importance in the segregation of the two functions. Good day to be having the panel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just, but, but part of that is too, I, I don't, if you want to plead ignorance here, but there is no regulation around that. So could you say, well, there was no guidelines or structure in place, so this is why we did what we did, outside of the fact commingling client assets, such that's kind of securities 101. But you know, these things will continue to happen unless there is a framework in, in place, because financial services were one of the most heavily regulated industries on the planet. Mm -hmm. And you know, you just can't willy-nilly put pull together, to your point, you know, um, regulation by enforcement, or else you're going to continue to see these FTXs. Yeah, that's right. And I think it's important to recognize, you know, crypto grew up in a place where there were not these structures in place already. And so I don't think anyone's condemning, um, you know, the uh, vertically integrated uh, retail broker, broker, <laughs> broker, exchange, custodian, prime model that are all in one doing, you know, a million different things. But we think that there's an alternative for customers that do want an alternative. And so, um, you know, providing those choices in crypto, you know, crypto digital assets are a lot about choice, right, and empowering customers and providing traditional choices to customers that want and demand that. And we think there's a great business to offer uh, it is really what we're focused on today. Um, I think that, you know, at, over time, the customers will determine if, if the regulators don't do it first, you know, what structure should look like. I think, um, you know, we believe at EDX that we would really welcome a lot more regulatory clarity and it's really benefited the U.S. markets, as we've said over the last hundred years, to have a lot of regulatory clarity, a separation of roles by, by regulation, and frankly, um, you know, the checks and balances that come in a market model where brokers are advocating for their customers, custodians are keeping their assets space safe, uh, exchanges are focused on price discovery, clearing houses mm -hmm. are focused on settlement uh, and reliable delivery of assets on a timely basis. Those are sort of the four pillars of what makes a really healthy market. Sure. And, and there's, you know, there's still OTC trading in equities, right? Yep. There's still OTC trading in FX. We're not suggesting that those all go away, but having a real um, strong complement of a traditional market structure can help this grow and can help regulators get comfortable with, with the development. And I'll tell you on that, I mean, I, Again, uh, like I said, I was, when I was founding kind of setting up Versify, a lot of the discussions and interviews I had with the TreadFi managers that manage collectively over you know, trillions, you know, the biggest concern I heard, number one, in market structure, when you dig in specifically what? Say custody. Mm -hmm. Everybody's concerned about custody. Right. Uh, they, don't, they can't custody the assets because they're all, they're all registered advisors and either qualified mm -hmm. custodian. Qualified custodians don't quite exist. And, if you kind of look at the exchanges, you can't combine the two. So custody is very important that it needs to be segregated, needs to be defined, it needs to be robust custodians that have enough balance sheet, et cetera. And, and you don't see a lot of that, unfortunately, today. So there needs to be that market. You don't see what, the custody or the? The, the, the kind of the, the real kind of traditional custodians that everybody's familiar well, I th with. I think like so. BNY Mellon, for example. I mean, I had, I had one of the world's but largest but managers telling me if BNY Mellon was offering custody, right. I'd be in great. Mm -hmm. But it, could, it might happen. I, I think, because uh, I can go on and on about the... the, the, the uh, well, we have a minute and a half, so... <laughs> on the disappointing space of where we are uh, in the U.S. But the, uh, on the flip side, if we want to kind of look at the optimistic view, what I would say right now at CrossX, 100% of our executions uh, are happening internationally and with international institutions, right? Keeping it, we have a, a partnership in the U.S. We'll be announcing in the next month or so, and th th you just can't ignore the U.S. Mm -hmm. And there is a feeling that when you look at okay, who is the biggest ETF provider in the world? Uh, it's BlackRock. It's an American. Who is uh, the largest, at least by uh, publicly stated market cap, crypto exchange in the world? It's Coinbase, running a massive company. I think it's sixty billion dollar market cap as of yesterday, or something like this. So there is a feeling that while timing is uh, unfortunate. If the U.S. when we get it right, the, yeah. the power in the U.S. is so substantial catch that up. everyone's yeah. going to catch up. No, the no, day no, that BNY comes into custody, and, I and it's true. I mean, we're yeah. we're unabashedly a U.S.-based market for digital assets, and we've had tremendous success. Our our growth curve has been steeper than the recent growth curve in crypto. We're you know relatively new, so that's expected. But um, but I think you know 
firms have had a challenge in getting uh, customers to join US-based exchanges, but I think with a great um, set of backers like we have with Citadel and Virtu and Fidelity, with the right market structure, with the right protections put in place, there is a real opportunity, and I think if we can execute on all of that, the US can rebound in terms of its leadership role totally. in digital asset markets. Right. Well, the regulators need to step in and start doing their and job. And we'll leave that on a positive <laughs> note. I think we're all in agreement note. there. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, thank you everyone for joining us on Trade Talks, and thanks for joining me from MarketSite. I'm Joe Melandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.